All right, test, test, everybody can hear me. I'm okay, on sound? Uh, yes. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> so test, test, one, two, one, two. <laughs> Okay, sounds good. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Gary. Uh, I'm the lead engineer at uh, from Mitsubishi Electric. So today I will be discussing uh, CO2 air source heat pump water heater uh, with you more on the commercial side of things. So without further ado, let's get started. See my email uh, and my contact information on the screen. So feel free to reach out to me or to the organizer. And uh, if you have any question or concern or any additional information you may require, and we're happy to assist. So today's topic will be uh, focusing on uh, hot water generation, uh, mainly using air source heat pump water heater on different siphon methodology, as well as application. And on top of that, we're also discussing uh, the air source heat pump technology. So let's get started. Why is it important to have to, to be able to generate domestic hot water uh, with air source heat pump? Because uh, water heating is considered a very, very large uh, portion. It's about 19.3 uh, energy use for Canadian home and average about, yeah, five or 6% of energy use. Uh, for average commercial or institutional setting, and which is taking the information directly from NRCAN, uh, from their product heating technology side of things. Uh, and then this is based on 2017. So during the COVID, during the pandemic, uh, everybody's working from home, maybe on the space heating or water heating technology or water heating demand is definitely increased. And here are the three typical uh, uh, commonly used technology that we see when we are talking about uh, domestic hot water heating uh, technology. So first one is natural gas boiler. So that's the most common one we typically use or so typically see uh, in Canada. <clears throat> so they are using, they, they burn natural gas. Therefore, you're going to have uh, a lot of hot water in a very short period of time. However, you're going to have the byproduct, which is the CO2 emission, as well as the NOx. So toxic gas, it may be released to, uh, to the atmosphere, and then they will be uh, using to, uh, to create more uh, greenhouse gas. And second one is maybe using electric heater, so resistant heater. Um, yeah, they, even though they are using electricity, they are not really producing any uh, greenhouse gas. However, the efficiency is really not that great compared to what we're going to talk about today is the heat pump water heater. So the heat pump technology is using refrigerant plus compressor and to be able to uh, absorb heat from outside ambient, temp, uh, outside ambient air and to be able to generate hot water. Therefore, it is relatively safe compared to because there's no gas. And very, very energy efficient because the best boiler you can get is about 99% efficient. The typical electric resistant heater is about COP of one, which means whatever power goes in is equivalent to how much heat is coming out. And then whereas air source heat pump water heater will always have the COP, the efficiency greater than one. And in terms of maintenance costs, right, you will need to uh, regu regularly uh, check the connection for the boiler, natural gas connection, etc. However, 
inside the capital cost is definitely worth in our opinion to to definitely worth the the time and the effort and the money to look at into air source heat pump water heater uh, not just for energy efficiency point of view but also for environmentally friendly point of view and what is so here is just a comparison between the three different type of technology so first one you can see the like electrical electric gas boiler i'm sorry electric boiler uh, electric resistant heater is typically have a COP of one, where you have one kilowatt of electrical input, and then that will be one thermal kilowatt of hour of heating output. And whereas conventional natural gas boiler, the 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 the, <clears throat> the condensing boiler can have uh, efficiency down to sorry up to ninety nine percent, right? So it's still less than one. And however, we have the air to water heat pump system that will be able to take the electricity to operate a compressor and the fan for, for the refrigerant to take the heat out of the air and then discharge into and then uh, transfer the heat into the mask hot water. Therefore, the COP is often goes from one to three to more than three. So a lot of time you will hear as outside air temperature decreases, so is the capacity. But I always like to remind people that, you know, we also take shower in summer too. So let's say uh, in July, the COP can be 2.5, 2.8, 3, 3.5, especially if you are especially if you are taking all the heat out of the air from the from the nice hot air. So <clears throat> how does air source heat pump work? So you can see again, we are applying the electricity to run the compressor and the compressor will move the refrigerant across the indoor coil and the, sorry, the outdoor coil to take the heat from the outside air and then push it through the heat exchanger. And on the supply water side, you have cold water from the city and we are able to heat it all the way up to let's say 65, 70 degrees C to be stored inside the hot water tank and which will in turn be supplied to your, let's say your shower, your faucet. Therefore, we have one kilowatts of heat, electricity heat, and then we are able to take in the heat from the air and be able to generate COP of four, COP of three for the heat. So how it works is actually we're harvesting heat from the air and transfer it into water so we can have high COP. And on top of that is because we are taking the heat only from water, because he, sorry, on taking the heat only from the air. So therefore the air quality is really remain unchanged, right? So it's really just air blows through the copper and aluminum coil and then be able to take the refrigerant will be able to suck the heat out of there. So the air quality is remain unchanged, which is very important, especially sometimes if you are in an urban area, right? You don't want to add more pollution to the air. Therefore, you know, it's a big fact to be considered uh, when you are talking the urban area. So how stuff work is, so a heat pump water heater is moving heat from the environment to the water in the tank. So it draws air with a fan and passing it through the evaporator coil, which is a copper aluminum coil that contain refrigerant. The refrigerant is then adding the heat. So the, the refrigerant is absorbing the heat and then it's being compressed. So once it's, you add the pressure, you are increase the temperature. Therefore the heat refrigerant, and then the refrigerant now is high pressure and high temperature is now be able to transfer the heat into the water through the heat exchanger. That's what we see condenser over there. And this, this, this process is considered more efficient or more, uh, yeah, more efficient compared to some of the conventional uh, technology that we see before is natural gas uh, boiler have a condensing boiler can be have up to 99% uh, of efficiency or a resistant heater having a COP of typical up to and I'm using CO2 as a refrigerant so because we're trying to decarbonize and CO2 is a clean and green natural refrigerant so we have a uh, ozone depletion factor of zero, so no effect to our ozone. And it has a global warming potential of one. 
right? Therefore, it is really the base for all other refrigerant to be considered and then to, to, to have that effect. And it is a natural refrigerant where we can naturally harvest from our environment. So therefore it is considered clean, green and natural uh, refrigerant. And on top of that is very important is sometimes you are looking into a zero carbon building, you are looking for a lead building, high performance building. You are looking for a lot of time they may look at into leakage rate because every time you look at into refrigerant, you're looking into leakage rate. And then where you can see uh, A1 ref two has a global warming potential of one compared to let's say the R32 or R410A have in, in, in the 600 or even in the 2000s. Therefore, having even if the, there's a leak of a refrigerant into the environment, the effect may be minimized in terms of for the environment. So that's another thing to also consider. It is a green um, refrigerant. It is a natural refrigerant, low global warming potential, and then not affect anything on the ozone. And another good property for CO2 is because of its transcritical cycle. So it has a higher pressure compared to R410A. And what does that mean is the refrigerant will be able to remain in vapor state during the heating cycle. Therefore, it can transfer a lot more heat. And we're really looking into high volumetric capacity. So if you are looking to generate a lot of hot water in a long period of time, then uh, to having the high delta T between inlet and outlet, therefore CO2 will be a good refrigerant to do. And because the CO2 heating side is very good at even a low ambient condition. So because the pressure is just above the critical point and then it just gas cooling. So the CO2 will not condense or turn into liquid. So therefore the heat can be moved into the liquid. So increase the pressure, temperature often from 10, maybe 10 degrees C to 110 degrees C. And therefore the refrigerant will have a lot of energy being stored in there. And we are able to keep transfer those energy into the inlet water temperature. So therefore higher the delta T between the water and refrigerant, the better the, uh, the, the COP or the performance is. Therefore you can see on the chart in many, many manufacturers, we may, we may recommend it to have a high delta T between the inlet and outlet water temperature to be able to achieve that high uh, performance or high COP coefficient promote performance. So that's why you can see on the right hand side of the, the, the curve where we can see we want to have cold water goes in and how water comes out compared to the one on the right hand side, you have lukewarm water, right? And then go into and then having how water comes out. Therefore, the COP, the performance is really uh, uh, different if you're looking into different inlet water temperature, just so we are keeping the refrigerant above that uh, transcritical point. And so therefore, a lot of time, at least in our world, we're recommending a single pass unit with high lift. What does single pass mean? Single pass means you have cold water goes in and within one uh, one heat exchanger, we are able to have the high lift. Uh, so after maybe from 10 degrees C from the city, 10, 15 degrees C of city cold water, and then we are able to convert it or, uh, or heat it all the way up to 65, 70 degrees C and then store in the domestic hot water tank. And then being transferred or being used uh, downstream for a shower and all that. So you may ask, if we have single pass, what is multiple? So the one on the left hand side, right? It's a single pass unit typically found with the CO2 system where you can have a high lift from low, ten low temperature all the way up to high temperature. And then on the right hand side, you can see the multiple pass. So on the right hand, on the left hand side of the single pass unit, you can have high delta T about low GPN on the same capacity. And with multi-pass, oftentimes you will see is low delta T and high GPM. Therefore, a lot of time we are looking into is if a single pass unit, 
let's say we are charging a battery or we're charging a hot water tank for the daily usage. And then we are having a multi-part system to handle the low delta T and the constant flow for a hot water recirculation. So there is a lot of time we are looking at high lift application with CO2 heat pump, such as hot shower, faucet, right? Sports, gym, factory, hotels, where you are having a lot of hot water, right? And that can be stored in the tank and then being used in a short period of time. So there's always, uh, so for domestic hot water, there's always a, a peak and there's always domestic hot water usage is not always. Therefore, we feel a CO2 heat pump system with air source heat pump system will be a good use for that. And then in the latest slide, we're gonna give you some example. However, on the multi pass system where uh, you, are, you are having a constant low, let's say a pool, right? You constantly need to make to have pool make a water. So where you have, sometimes you're often looking for low delta T or reheat the pool water. So low delta T and high GPN, floor heating radiator, where it is not ideal for those low lift with a single single pass unit, such as a CO2 air source heat pump water heater. So here is a standard uh, configuration for, uh, yep, yeah, here is a standard configuration for a, a high lift system where you have a heat exchanger between the primary side, which is air to water, uh, air source heat pump water heater. And then on the secondary side, that's what we call a storage, right? as well as recirculation. Uh, often let's say you are living in a, in, a, in a condo, in a hotel where you open up your tap and then you're gonna have hot water right away. That's for recirculation. So, or, you know, like the gym I go to, uh, I don't really have hot water recirculation. I will just have a primary side and secondary side. So I will have stored the domestic hot water inside, this, inside the storage and I will have the high lift CO2 air source heat pump water heater to heat up all the water I require for the day usage. So for example, you can see for hotels, gyms, hospital, where we need a lot of amount of hot water every day, but there's always a peak and a valley where you can see on the curve at the bottom where the time of use is often critical. Right, so even for a, a food center, right, even for a cafeteria, <coughs> excuse me, even for a gym, right, for a hotel especially. Like when I go to a hotel, I wake up in the morning, I take shower, right, and then I come for the day, either for business conference, either for a touring, right. I come back and there is another peak in the evening. Same thing for apartment building, condominium building, where. There's always a valley and there's always, uh, sorry, there's always a valley and there's always a peak. Therefore, we want to create hot water during, uh, for the peak usage. Uh, however, traditionally, conventionally, we have been using either the combustion, natural gas, uh, natural gas boiler or electric heater. But consider global warming and energy conservation, uh, heat pump water heater will become or uh, are becoming Stream, and then we're starting to see more and more in uh, in North America, in Canada. We start to see more and more in the last two three years. Especially some of the jurisdiction are really looking to to completely get rid of natural gas boiler uh, for certain kind of application. So therefore, we are looking into it. And then, especially in Japan and in Europe, the the CO two hot water heat pump system has been used in many, many, many applications. So if you took, if you type CO2, uh, air source heat pump with CO2 as a refrigerant, and then Japan, you will see tons and tons of different manufacturers out there to do it. That is just a brief overview of what is air source heat pump water heater and what are the common technology that we see. It can be used in a typical application. So again, the air source heat pump water heater is heat from outside air and transfer the heat into the refrigerant because 
because uh, refrigerant is very uh, very good heating and cooling medium. So it's sucking the heat out of outside air, and then that, and then adding the pressure into the refrigerant can store a lot of heat. And those heat can be used for to heat that domestic hot water usage for uh, for your uh, for the day use. So therefore, we are really looking into a single pass unit where you are taking cold water and then take into the domestic hot water requirement to be stored inside the tank. So that is really just how stuff work in the background. And if you are really, really interested in knowing what's happening in the background on the CO2, on the refrigerant cycle, on the pH diagram, feel free to reach out to us and then we can have a, set, a different section on this. But the next question is, well, now the air to water heat pump system is so wonderful. And how do we size it? What, what's the difference between uh, sizing a domestic hot water system with air source heat pump versus a conventional technology? So for example, over here, you can see from domestic hot water heating design guide from American Society of uh, Plumbing Engineer, you can see they are looking into a two different rule. So 33, so they, that means you have 30 minutes of generation and a storage for five, uh, sorry, storage tank good for uh, three hours usage. Or you are using a five minute peak demand for instantaneous system. So those are the conventional way or traditional way to do that. And you can actually find very, very, uh, very, very simple uh, example uh, example that you can see of sizing those units. So first one is you find out how much heat is required, how much how much hot water is required based on how many people is how many people uh, occupancy. So for example, in here they are looking for a median um, factor. That means uh, most of people are probably a working professionals with 198 people, and then pick it and then using it for one hour of usage. That means your low is about uh, 16, uh, 1,663 gallons per hour or 23 uh, gallons per minute. Or, and then step B, you want to convert that into uh, how much heating input for you to size your boiler. So in here, you can see the boiler efficiency. So I need this much of hot water and I need to heat up this much hot water from, let's say, uh, with a 90 degree delta, delta T, 90 degree de uh, Fahrenheit of delta T, and based on 80% efficiency of boiler, this is how much input, and this is how much you can size your uh, boiler system. And you can also refer to Ashri handbook uh, in application. So the one I have is 2019. So you can go to chapter 51 with service hot water heating. And in a very, very similar method, they are showing you how much hot water can be used, can be sized, or how much water is required and how much heating is required. So for example, you can see I am having um, uh, based on their method, they are looking into evaluate the range of water heating system. And for 58 units, this many people, and then with uh, entering air, entering water temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and then the living water temperature 120 F with a boiler that's 80% efficient. And therefore you can see that's a formula they use. So I strongly recommend that you review this and then see what is the methodology that's being used behind or conventionally when people are looking into sizing the domestic hot water system. And however, they don't really give an example of sizing, uh, sizing the system with base water heater. However, you can see over here, they did mention that refrigerant based water heater is usually the refrigerant water heat, refrigerant based water heat assistant is typically to look at into operating range between 12 to 18 hours. So that means we're having a higher and longer uh, recovery period compared to, you know, what we see before 30 and three, 
run in a boiler for 30 minutes and to generate enough water for, uh, <clears throat> for three hours of usage. And why is that? It's because refrigerant-based system usually come, will often come with a compressor, right? And then similar to, you know, uh, any other electronics, we don't like to turn it on and off very often. Therefore, we want to have the equipment to be running for a long extended period and then to generate enough hot water for the use for the day. So how do we size it? How do we compare it? It's actually very simple. So first you find out how much hot water is required per person per day, right? And then we are able to convert that through a simple uh, formula, Q equals delta T. So quantity of energy is equal to how much water needs to be heated up. And then based on the specific heat of the water and the temperature difference. So if I want to heat up, so let's say for a building, I require <coughs> 15,000 liters of water and I want to heat the water up from 10 degrees C to 65 degrees C. Therefore, I'm really looking into 15,000 uh, liter. Well, convert that into kilogram, right? And then multiply that by 4.18, which is the specific heat of water. And then the delta T of 65 minus 15 C. Sorry, 15 to, sorry, I made a, a typo here. It should be 65 to 15 uh, C or from 15 degrees C all the way to 65 degrees C. And then I need to divide that by 3,600 to convert from one day into 3,600 uh, to a minute to an hour, right? So 24 hour multiplied by, yeah. So one, um, I need to convert it from uh, seconds into hour. So I, uh, in the end of the day, I am converted, so I say I have a building that requires 15,000 liter, and then I need to heat it from 15 degrees C all the way to 65 degrees C. And this is how much kilowatt hour of heat requirement that I need. So you can see over here on the right hand, left hand side, the capacity of heat pump system is heat low per day, right? How many kilowatt hour per day, and then divided by uh, heat pump out, heat pump operation per Hour. So I'm looking at this is yeah. So in here, assuming I am working about sixteen hours of operation at minus 10 degrees C of outside air temperature because as outside air temperature decreases, so is the capacity of heat pump. Therefore, we are looking at manufacturer uh, presented uh, provided curve. Now we can see a worst case scenario, minus 10 degrees C, let's assume we're in, in, in Vancouver. So minus 10 degrees C, we're looking at about 30 kilowatts of heating require uh, of heating capacity from the air source heat pump system. And therefore at minus 10 degrees C, each uh, air source heat pump system can generate 30 kilowatts of heat. And then to heat up 15,000 liter of water from 15 degrees C to 65 degrees C, I'm looking for 870 kilowatt hour. And I divide the the design work operating hour of the heat pump of 16 hours. So I need 54 kilowatts of heating requirement. And therefore I will need two pieces of equipment to satisfy the load at the coldest day at the worst case scenario. But you have to remember, we also have to find out not only on the worst case scenario, and we also have some to look at into the actual operating time. So for example, in here, uh, in the Ashray handbook, we're looking into about 12 to 16, 18 hours daily of runtime as your design condition. Uh, very often, you also have to 
the design temperature at the hardest day as well. What does that mean? That means if my design temperature is, if I designed it, my system to run only in, instead of 16 hours, I decided my system to run at the coldest day for let's say four hours or six, eight hours, four hours from eight hours. Therefore, on the hardest summer time, because 27 degrees C and above, I'm about double the capacity of my design day. As you can see over here in the Vancouver temperature in the summertime in August, right? They can be as hot as 28 degrees C and as cold as uh, 11 or 13 degrees C. Therefore, the operating time may decrease quite significantly. Therefore, we are really looking into designing an air to water system, refrigerant based system for to run it at an extended period of time. Therefore, you can see, let's do a comparison between the system we are running it for 33 uh, guideline versus air to uh, air source heat pump water heater to run it for 16, 12 to 16, 18 hours a day. So we still need to heat up all the hot water, right, from 15 degrees C all the way to 65 degrees C to be stored in the tank. And you can see the difference between your heat source of equipment can be dramatically reduced. So for capacitor agent, you can see we're looking at 104 kilowatts versus 350 kilowatts of heat pump versus a, a natural gas boiler. However, for natural gas boiler, your storage is actually a lot less than the hot water system. I mean, sorry, the heat pump system. The reason is because we are looking to store, we are looking to run the boiler for let's say 30 minutes to run three hours. So that means once you draw all the water down, you are actually can be easily replenish the hot water tank. Compared to an air to water heat pump system, they have a lower recovery rate because we want to run it a little bit longer. Therefore, uh, the storage needs to be bigger and then in order to accommodate for the usage. So it's like charging a battery, right? So I want to charge my battery, I charge it whole night so I can use it for the next day. So I charge my cell phone in the evening when I go to bed so I can use it for the next day, right? Or compared to other types of technology or computation technology, you will see. So in a way is where really the, the hot water storage tank is very much like a is very much like a, like a battery now you need to charge. So we have shown you a very, very simple kind of uh, operation on design of um, just to do a, a, a check on the uh, system. However, it's the 21st century. So very often we found this uh, tool called EcoSizer that's available online that will be able to size and calculate how much heat is required. So you can see, it's a very, very simple step-by-step -step that you can see. And it follow the method that's similar to ASHRAE and the, and the American Society of Plumbing Engineer. So you are able to size it based on your occupancy and how many people in there. And you really need to determine how much hot water usage per gallon per person per day. So it's able to convert that into uh, the the heating capacity requirement and your tank value depending on usage and depending on how it's being used uh, depending on usage and depending depending on your application so i would strongly recommend it even though the online calculator is available from ecosizer i would still recommend you to review the uh the the, the usher method or the american society of plumbing engineer method that you can see giving you on um, different methodology on low, medium, and high, 25 gallons per hour, per, per, 25 gallons per day, and then the usage and to understand it or refer to the user manual, which is a very, very uh, well-written document in their, in their, uh, in, on their website.
So it gives you the criteria that's required for how are the usage and that. And next is we talk about how the how are is being generated and now let's talk about storage. So a lot of time it depends on how you are going to store the, the equipment, I mean store the hot water. So you can see in here, just depending on the different operating hour, right? So for hours, my storage is bigger compared to I'm only operating for a shorter period of time. Every rate, bigger the tank. And on top of that, you also need to consider uh, the low shifting versus storage that you can see. So for example, in here, if I, so in Ontario, uh, where I'm sitting right now, we have, we have the peak rate and then the low, low rate. So I'm assuming I am not generating any domestic hot water between 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Sorry, uh, yeah, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. That's where the, peak electricity or mid-tier electricity rate is, then obviously I am having 12 hours to generate domestic hot water uh, on a lower rate. Therefore, I will need to generate, to, 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 to be able to, to capture all the hot water that will be used for the day usage. Compared to a thing, we just let the unit run on its own. So, on the same 12 hour period, my tank may be smaller because I am generating hot water maybe in the evening and then deplete it in the morning for the first peak and then generate it again for another six hours to for second peak that you can see. So my water is actually being filled up, gradually depleted, and the unit can, uh, can, can be used again to generate hot water. Therefore, we're really looking into a different storage, different operation, because we are really wants to have the air source uh, heat pump water heater to work in conjunction with a primary storage volume to fill the massive hot water usage. And we're storing at 140, 160 uh, range. And however, for a low profile, we're really looking to swing tank. Therefore, we are kind of looking into a different combined kind of methodology on sizing the different tank. So, so delivery calculated primary load. So a lot of time you size your uh, QHV to be able to calculate your primary load for the peak period. And then even though we has a lower recovery rate and you still need to uh, uh, in capture adequate amount of water to be able to use for the day usage. Therefore, you can sink in into whether you want to utilize low shifting or just not using just or, or just using a standard uh, low leveling method. So that's your uh, freedom, and that really depends on how much space you have in the in the room for storage tank, and then how much hot water can be uh, is required can be used. And on top of that, you really need to think about sizing your QHV to run for extended period of time. Sorry, uh, sorry, my bad. So sizing your air to water heat pump, so sizing your CO2 uh, hot water heater for an extended period of time. Uh, not just for the winter, but also thinking about summertime because we don't want the compressor to be cycled on and off too often. Therefore, you don't want to oversize it too much but you also don't want to oversize it, uh, undersize too much. And not just looking at the worst case scenario all the time, but also looking into the best case scenario, right? Because again, like what I often mentioned is, uh, people take shower in summer too, right? So not just in winter, but also looking in summer. On top of that is there are different methodology for you to control a system. So for example, we're looking into having a three thermostat in the tank and then to turn on and off the uh, air to water heat pump system, depending on outside air system and operating time or the tank size. So for example, on the left-hand side, if the volume is large, that means when the, uh, when the tank is half empty or half filled with cold water, that's just quickly recover the water. So turn on the, the, air to water heat pump system 
to recover the hot water. And so because uh, at the same time as you are drawing the water. However, if your tank is small, so obviously you don't want the compressor to cycle on and off too often. Therefore, you are turning it on when the cold water reaching the top of the tank and then turn it off when the, 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 the tank is half empty or half filled with cold water or hot water. So different methodology, different strategy that you can talk to the manufacturer. But again, just remember outside air temperature, operating time and low recovery rate. And we are able to really think about what is required. To the tank. So just a reminder, if you are looking into a air to water heat pump system versus a natural gas boiler, or you are looking into uh, doing a retrofit project, very, very often I have seen uh, projects where people say, I need this much of heating, right? And then my tank is very, very small. And then immediately I see, okay, how many, how many air to water heat pump system do I need? Then immediately I say, that's probably not the right way because it's not like to like, it is not a direct exchange or it's not a direct swap because you can see very clearly in the domestic hot water guide or in the Ashray handbook, if you are looking into a boiler plus gen, pro, uh, a natural gas boiler plus storage, you are looking at 33 rule. Whereas in the Ashray handbook, they are saying refrigerant based air to water, uh, refrigerant based water heater is to typically designed to run about 12 to 6, 18 hours of runtime. <clears throat> Therefore, you can see for uh, air to water heat pump system, you need large storage, but less amount of heat requirement because you are running it for longer compared to a natural gas boiler where you need a lot of heat, but smaller storage. Uh, here, Gary, I had a quick uh, question from the chat. If you want to, uh, if I could read it out for you, you can answer. So the yep. question is, will smaller multi-CO2 units be available in the future to respect the 18-hour average operating time where smaller residential demands exist? So the uh, so the, the smaller multi-CO2 units are actually already available in the market, um, some, uh, yeah, in North America, uh, but a lot of them are actually right now available, currently available in, in, in Europe, in Japan. So yeah, in the future, if there's a demand, obviously we will bring it to, to Canada. Uh, however, yeah, we do know uh, the small residential CO2 system. Uh, I know there are products available. So yeah, you can uh, take a look. And then again, very similar It's I wouldn't say it is like uh, only for CO2, but typically for refrigerant based system with a compressor with electronics, uh, we want it to run for a longer period of time, right? So it's not cycling on and off. So yes, if there is a demand, then yeah, uh, we'll bring it to, to the market. And then uh, yeah, to respect the 18 hours average operating time, yep, well, we will be able to do that in the future. Okay, thank you. So here are just some of the questions, some of the example that we see, uh, not just in North America, but all around the world. This one is actually from Japan, where they typically for a hotel, uh, they have a public bath or hot spot. So you can see this is a hotel and um, they are having the air to water heat pump system, the, mount, the single pass unit to create the hot water storage. That'd be the primary load for the entire building for the day. And then they are having a multi-pass system for the temperature maintenance load to set the temperature to, to have that hot water recirculation. Therefore, the advantage is it's an energy and cost saving system, especially if we are here in Toronto, um, I will be able to, to perhaps run in the air to water system from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. every day, and then to capture the lowest electricity rate and then running for 12 hours to capture the majority of hot water required for the day usage. And then we are having the multi-pass system just kind of doing the temperature maintenance for the, for, 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 the, for the building as required. 
And then another thing is no combustion work or no cumbersome work related to operation. Everything is fully automated. And on top of that, there's no gas and there's no, uh, no quote unquote air pollution, <laughs> I guess, if you may, uh, for greenhouse gas production um, in a lot of this application. Another project uh, out in, another project, uh, again, out in, I believe, uh, just oversee, uh, we're looking for to combine the hot water system with the uh, existing uh, steam boiler, right? Again, a lot of hot water for the usage, usage, and then, then you're having the small uh, boiler to do the maintenance, perhaps. Uh, but definitely the fuel consumption is dramatically reduced because again, we are not heating up the city water from 10 degrees C or 15 degrees C all the way to 65 degrees C anymore. We are really maintaining the water and maintaining the temperature uh, from let's say 40, 35 degrees C all the way to 60 inside the recirculation tank. So therefore, the obviously the amount of heating is requirement for uh, is reduced because the delta T is lower, but sorry, the and then the fuel consumption is obviously reduced. And some of the project uh, out in in North America is actually I take this uh, from uh, from 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 a government website out in the states, so bpa.gov. So in their advanced water heating technology, they are actually having several projects out there uh, in the field. They are studying, they are looking into, and then they are playing with different methodology. So for example. Uh, CO2, uh, air to water heat pump system with low. So, uh, for example, Bayview Tower, that's the one in Seattle, where one air to water heat pump system and then having a tank and then be able to generate hot water usage for the entire building. And there are other projects, for example, I recently visited a hotel out in Cincinnati and then they are using a uh, 304 the air to water heat pump system and having large tank that's able to produce enough hot water for the usage for full service hotel, including restaurants, uh, the guests, et cetera, et cetera. So they are able to utilize that and then really, really taking the off peak uh, electricity uh, from, the, from the grid to, 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 to lessen the, the, the stress on the electrical grid. And lastly, another uh, clever project to think outside the box is we have a project out in Sweden, again, overseas. So they've been using this product for many, many years. So because we all know the massive hot water usage sometimes have uh, is often a peak and a valley, and it's not always stable, right? And on top of that is the massive hot water usage is not always constant. So they are looking into a clever engineering to have a second tank and then working as a multi-pass system to really drive down the, the, the heat and then to really. So for example, if uh, this, this is, pump, this is, is for car wash. So if you have enough heat and then for the mass car water usage for the car wash, as well as for the snow melt, then you can activate both tank at the same time. So we can share those. So there's a lot of potential in our opinion to utilize this, this technology. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, any uh, question uh, can help to answer. All right, we'll give it then a couple minutes then just to see if people have any questions to filter through. So yeah, if anybody has any questions for Gary, please uh, feel free to write them in the chat for right now. Okay, I don't think we have any questions coming through as of right now, but I guess then Gary as well too, if maybe you wanna 
uh, go back to the start and then provide your email again too. If maybe anybody has any additional questions and stuff like that, they can kind of uh, send your way if they think about it. So yeah, perfect. If you see right there on the screen, there's Gary's contact information as well too, if you'd like to get in contact with him with any questions or. All right, so we have a one question. So um, these uh, presentations will also be available up to 30 days after the event ends. And then we also will be turning these presentations into articles that will feature on our magazine. Uh, so this one will feature in our uh, May, June edition of the magazine. But yes, you can access these presentations still up to 30 days after the event ends. Awesome. Okay, perfect. So hopefully that answers uh, your question, uh, Priyal. Okay. Oh, perfect. We have one question from Darren. Uh, he asks, have these units been tested in the northern BC and Alberta regions where temps can get as low as minus 40 C? So I cannot speak for all manufacturer, but often uh, as outside temperature decreases, right? And then uh, so is the capacity for air to water uh, uh, heat pump system. So for northern region uh, that will reach minus 40 degrees C, I will actually say using it in a similar approach as a, a conventional heat pump system where you still implement backup heat. And again, uh, and not again, but uh, in a similar kind of situation is, um, let me bring it up. So for example, we can have an air to water single pass unit to run for the majority of the time. But for colder region, let's say Alberta, uh, you know, gas is cheap. I'll be right. We all know gas is cheap. So maybe you are able to also implement a gas system for on the multi-pass side of things, right? So in a way is we're trying to generate as much hot water as we can, but if the heat pump cannot keep up, then just turn on your gas boiler. And using the gas boiler, and then uh, going back is uh, the methodology is you know thirty and three. So I'm running the 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 boiler for thirty minutes. That will be able to generate enough amount of hot water for three hours. So the the gas boiler can for punch and then be able to uh, generate enough hot water. So. Our recommendation for northern part of the, the Canada on the Colden region is perhaps thinking about a dual fuel operation. So for example, I still have my uh, air to water single pass heat pump system for majority of time in the year, right? Let's say from, I never live in Alberta, but I can imagine let's say even from uh, April all the way to uh, end of September, October, early October, or in October, if pushing it, then we can be majority of time running those uh, single pass unit to generate enough hot water for the day usage. And then having the multi pass system, such as maybe a natural gas boiler with a smaller tank, and that can also work as a, a, a temperature a maintenance tank, then that would be a good solution to have a dual fuel approach. Perfect. Thank you for that question, Darren. Uh, I guess we'll leave it open again for a couple. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to uh, send them our way right now. Okay, I think uh, I think we're all ready to go then. So again, Gary, thank you very much for your presentation. and. For all the attendees who are here at the event right now, we are going to take a little bit of a break in between our next session. So if you guys want to head over now into the uh, lounge, we have a little break lounge where everyone can kind of pop in. This is your time to maybe, you know, go to the bathroom, get a drink of water, maybe get something to quickly get something to eat as well, too. But in that lounge, there's also the opportunity for everyone to kind of network and connect with each other as well, too. So if you go to that left hand side of your screen, once you leave this presentation, you'll see the lounge tab. And we'll have that break lounge in there as well, too. So if you guys would like to join into there, we'd hopefully would really appreciate seeing you guys. If not, our next session will begin then. Oh, sorry, there's a little playback. Well, our uh, next session will begin at 2.30. So again, Gary, thank you very much. And we'll see you guys, hopefully everybody in the uh, break lounge room. So take care. Yeah, thank you.